there has been a satanic assault on the church from the day of Pentecost. We read about it through in the book of Acts and in every epistle in the New Testament. And most of the time, we fail to realize and certainly fail to realize vividly how awful the assault is. We go along attending our churches, having a good social time. Emphasis social. Notice how the churches brought in years ago, the charismatics, greet each other in the middle of a service where you're starting to worship God. And then you get back and they meet together and everybody talks about something natural. Well, that's not the place in which to do it. Certainly not a service that's dedicated to the Lord. Because ordinary things don't come in to worship of God. They're in our ordinary lives. The worship of God and the operation of the Spirit and the Word of God comes in to our ordinary lives. But our ordinary lives cannot come in to divine order. The two don't meet because we have a spiritual part of us, as we all know, but forget. Now I'm speaking generally, and this is really relates to hundreds of millions of believers, maybe billions from, from day one. I don't know what they did the first hundred years in this regard. From then on, the church slipped, slipped, slipped. And it has recovered itself to a certain extent with the beginning of Martin Luther. This is the West, not the East. But we, the more we progress as, a church, as the church, the worse becomes the assault. And we fail to see it. If we don't know our enemy, how can we fight him? You know, there's an old adage, know your enemy. We don't know our enemy. We haven't heard enough about him. What we have heard has been gravely erroneous, especially in churches that, that almost don't know the devil exists. And certainly in other churches that are more aware of the Holy Ghost, who ought to know, but settle down on our lees, which we've all done. We all follow. We're better followers than we are leaders. And I have been much thoughtful about all these things for many a day, certainly this week. And we need to realize we have such an enemy that we need to be engrossed in finding out where he is, what he has done, and even though we could never influence the church, and maybe we can't influence enough people, although certainly hundreds and hundreds are going to my website, what they're seeing I don't know. Obviously somebody's liking it. Well, that's only hundreds. There are millions. But we can make a difference in our own lives and hopefully reach out to our families bit by bit. If they're the only ones to listen, praise God. If others don't listen, that's up to them. So we're looking at the Word of God again as it is stated in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And of course, we're well aware of that chapter. I don't believe there was ever a war in heaven. That we think of as heaven being God's abode. Maybe in the first heaven, there are three heavens as God's abode. And the war here did not take place in God's abode or in that heaven. 
as we saw last week, heaven is the sky above. And that's where the war was. And we're going to see again how that Satan d didn't really exist in thought. In the very early days of creation, except regarding the Garden of Eden. And it does not state where he came from. It would appear he's a strong, evil angel who left his first estate, as mentioned in Jude. Because there is no scripture that says they were thrown out. The idea of following Isaiah 14 is absolute rubbish, as we proved last week by looking at the chapter. It's about the king of Babylon, not about Satan. Satan is not Lucifer. Lucifer is a strong demon, who of course is satanic. Now how you divide Satan from the demons, I am really not sure because the scriptures don't fully tell us and all that you hear from theologians is, is conjecture. And of course, I have listened to conjecture, of course, as we all do. So having said that, this is what it says in verse 17. The dragon became enraged with the woman who is the church and he couldn't touch the beginning of the church that had given birth to the Saviour because the church carried on from what Israel had been to an extent, a certain extent. So he being, became enraged with this woman who was saved from his attack, you know, this is an allegory, by the earth opening its mouth and helping the woman and swallowing up the river which the dragon had spewed out of, out of his mouth. An allegory. That, but it has deep and true spiritual meaning. So he became enraged with her, couldn't do anything else about her. He departed to make war with the rest of her seed because he, he, he had already attempted to make war with, it, with her seed, which is Jesus Christ. So now what's he doing? He's making war with all the seed of the Lord Jesus Christ who keep God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. He's at war against us. It's more collective than it is individual. But because it's collective and we're in amongst the collective, it becomes individual to us. But it's not such a personal attack as a lot of people like to think. The devil is after me. They think the devil's after them every day. It's not quite like that. The devil's already been after them through the things they heard, maybe through the lips of the preacher who led them to Christ. Through the, those things. I mean, I've heard evangelists, many top evangelists, Australian, American, English. There was an Englishman called Lionel Fletcher. He came over in my youth, a very famous evangelist. I've heard them. You listen to them. And you also hear, if you follow out their preaching and their books, grave errors. The dragon is attacking the seed through the very person who led us to Christ. In my case, it was my parents, godly people from godly people, born again, filled with the Spirit. But they had been attacked by the dragon in the preaching they heard and followed, of course. A young Christian will always follow what they hear from the person or the preacher who has led them to Christ. It's just a natural thing. So what do you think the dragon, dragon's doing to upset this Christian? Making sure the preacher has it all wrong. This is the very opposite of what happens in heaven when a soul finds Christ. 
Jesus said, There is joy in the presence of the angels. At every person's repentance, there's joy. There's been joy. But the joy will not last if they're totally overcome by the enemy and die in their condition. Which happens to many more probably than we ever realize and who we don't know. So the enemy of I have said the church, and that's what everybody says, is Satan. It's not the church. I was astounded. Now, I knew this meaning of known it since my youth. Well, certainly since my 20s. We belong to the ecclesia, which is the called out ones. So I looked it up again in Strong's Concordance, and there are quite a number of verses that mention church. I went through, through a few of them. Every single Greek meaning is not church. It's congregation or assembly. We're the a congregation, not the church. Of course we're not the church. The church is the church building that houses people who belong to the Lord and who don't. The assembly is those who gather together who belong to the Lord. Now the brethren have a point there. Uh, they, they follow, which is not totally correct in my mind, but they certainly follow this in their communion service. You have to really belong to the assembly and they have to know that you're born again. Well, I don't think they're right in that, but they certainly are right in their idea that you do have to belong to the assembly. It's, we have to belong to the assembly, to the called out ones, not the church. Churches in, all over the world are full of people who are called out ones, and that includes amongst the, the crowd also those who are not called out. And that's why when evangelists sometimes come to denominational churches, many of the members get saved and baptized in water, as I found out with the Baptist church at the end of my street, to my utmost surprise. I thought everybody would be born again who belonged there, because in the Assemblies of God, you couldn't belong unless you were born again. So, of course, in those days, I don't know what it is today. So, we have the... Satan against the assembly, against the congregation of the righteous. He's against us. He's not against those other people who belong to the church in the sense that we are. He tries to get them not converted, but his fight is against us. And I, I would like to turn us for a while to the book of Jude, because we're going to cover a, a lot today that is most interesting. And I would encourage anybody who watches this video, please don't turn it off. You may not have the world's best preacher in front of you. You haven't. You haven't got that char char charismatic preacher who, who attracts thousands and millions, but you've got somebody who's presenting you with something that is from the Word of God and some new things that you need to learn and need to know. We're still learning. Are you still learning? Now we look at Jude again because I'd like to point to this. Jude chapter, uh, verse 6. The angels who did not keep their first domain or estate but deserted their own dwelling place. He all has also kept in darkness an eternal change for the judgment of the great day. Likewise, as these angels did, that's what likewise means, doesn't it? Likewise, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them had given themselves over to sexual immorality 
and our natural relations in the same way as these angels. Clear. They are presented as an example, suffering the punishment of eternal fire. Yet these people, now it's talking about people around the church, do the same thing. In their delusion, they degrade the flesh, despise authority of God, of course, and slander the glorious beings. The glorious beings are those angels who left their first estate and who continue on in some form, not the same way, not the same way, but they continue on in some form to this day, as we learn from the book of Enoch, that is most instructive in this regard. But the archangel Michael, when he struggled with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare to bring against the devil an evil speaking judgment, but said, May the Lord rebuke you. So here is Jude, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, a servant of God, an apostle, not the twelve apostles, sp speaking things that he has read, one, in the book of Enoch, or he wouldn't be saying it, two, in another book, I'm not sure if it's the book of Barnabas, uh, I forget what I read about that, and I haven't downloaded it yet, about the struggle about the body of Moses is not in the Old Testament. Neither of those things in clarity. Certainly the latter is not in the Old Testament. The former is not there in clarity because many people won't accept it. So we are looking at this in the, in the, in, in the book of, of Enoch. Now I have three translations of the book of Enoch. And there are things in the book of Enoch that every Christian should know. It is an inspired part of the word of God. And I dare say that, not because it's my assumption, not because I have come to believe it. I would not say it if it did not have stronger, uh, uh, stronger legs on which to stand upon. I would not say it. It is irrefutable that the book of Enoch and the Apocrypha and a few other books were in the Greek of the, of the time of Jesus' day. They all spoke Greek. The whole Roman Empire, even as far as India and I, I'm not sure about Britain, but I guess it's the case, although I never learned that at school, spoke Greek. It was the language. Now, the British had an empire in India. So what is the medium of education there in, re in relation to the universities, in relation to the Christian schools? I've, I've, pre I've spoken to the students in English in many... A, many a school in India, many an orphanage, English. It's the medium because India belonged to the British Empire and to this day, even though they left it, oh, I don't know how many years ago, 50 years ago or so, English is not a required language, but the required language of the educated. The same thing occurred in the Roman Empire, everybody there spoke, spoke Greek because everybody there was on a more, on a more level, uh, a, a level strata of society than ever there is or has been in India with its caste system. And on top of that, I, I have a, a seen online, concrete proof that it was the Roman Catholic Church and the Jews that, that removed 
the book of Enoch. They did not like they did not like the things that were there by then. They, they refused to receive them for whatever reason which we spoke about last week and I don't want to go into now. So then on top of this, now this is fact. The King James Version, in particular the Old Testament, and it would relate to the New Testament because Jeremy, a Roman Catholic, who did translations in the second or third century and went to Jerusalem and was friendly with the rabbis there who were Masoretes, Talmudic, follow the Kabbal. Uh, what is it called? They, they followed the Kabbal. They were Kabbalistic. In other words, they weren't true followers of the God of our Old Testament in whatever form has come to us. And in, in the King James Version and in English, unless you get the Septuagint, you do not have an uncorrupted translation. Now, in relation to the New Testament, I'm still looking into that. I, can't, I wish I could find somebody who could trans who would translate the Ethiopian church's uh, New Testament that goes way back and the earliest Greek manuscript that somebody could find because you know when they translated when they translated into the New Testament from uh, uh, going back to Jeremy even who did not a bad translation in the Vatican, in what they call the Vaticanus, in the Vulgate. Not a bad translation that the Protestants have despised. Not bad. He included the Apocrypha. He didn't include Enoch. It was out. They don't, didn't want Enoch. And when you read Enoch, you can see why. It's got more clear references to Jesus Christ the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Redeemer, he who is to come, than any other book in the Old Testament. Now, the Jews didn't want that, and, and the Roman Catholics aren't all that happy about that kind of thing. So, in relation to the New Testament, do you know that, that we don't have a, old manuscripts You've got thousands of pieces. Don't get me wrong. You can rely on the New Testament you have. You can rely on the Old Testament you have. You can stick with it if you like. You just won't know all there is that you should know. That's all. But you get there. How many people in the West are in heaven today because they followed our New Testament and Old Testament? And the King James was never popular in USA for quite a long time. They had uh, uh, that other version, which I forget, Swiss version or something. They didn't follow the King James there like the English did. And they were English speaking. So the Masoretes, in relation to the manuscript of the Old Testament, had not finished and collated their corrupted one from which our King James Version comes until 1000 AD. But the Greek one, the Septuagint, translated into English, goes back many centuries before that. In fact, it goes back to 200 BC. So we can rely on it. We need to know this because there are wonderful things in these books that we need to know. Now, I'm reading to you from certain pages uh, in this translation that is supposed to be the best English translation by an Englishman, and we won't go into that. His name is Nib, and he, he was a scholar and a, a church person. And so this is what he says that Enoch says. 
These are the words of the blessing of Enoch. According to which he blessed the chosen and righteous. Are you chosen? Are you righteous? Who must be present on the day of distress, which is appointed for the removal of all the wicked and impious. And he said this, and he's not saying that in relation to the flood there. He speaks about the flood elsewhere. For he says, there was a righteous man, that's him, his eyes were opened by the Lord and he saw a holy vision in the heavens. Who else did that in the Old Testament? Ezekiel? Isaiah? Those are the only two. Which the angel showed to me and I heard everything from them. And listen to this. I understood what I saw, but not for this generation, but for a distant generation that will come. Now, the generation of the flood wasn't that far distant. And he says, concerning the chosen, I spoke. That's us. The holy and great one will come out of his dwelling. Look, we're the chosen. The ones of the New Testament are the chosen. You can read all through the Old Testament and you will never see any word that calls the saints of the Old Testament. They were saints. They were godly people then. They're never called chosen, now are they? They're never called the elect. We're called the chosen and the elect in the New Testament, under the gospel. So he's speaking about us. And then he says, further down, what's what uh, Jude quoted. And he, behold, he comes with 10,000 saints to execute judgment upon them and to destroy the impious and to contend with all flesh concerning everything that the sinners and the impious have done and wrought against him. Who quotes that? Jude, which we didn't read. So here already, in the beginning of the book that has been brought to our notice, there's three translations online. You can download them or you can buy one translation. I urge you to do it. You go to our website, revirene.org, and you'll see a connection. It should be there. Yeah. Where you can order the Book of Enoch. I think it only costs $7.50 plus postage, but it's quite cheap. So now we're going to look at something else. Now, Enoch talks about the watches of heaven, the angels. You might say, that's a strange expression. It's in Daniel, I think it is, chapter 4. And I, if I'm not mistaken, it's in another place in the Old Testament. It says in our King James Bible, angels or watchers. So he's talking to certain ones of the, amongst that company of watchers. Why have you left the high, holy and eternal heaven? Not why were you thrown out. Why did you act like that so that God read you, threw you out? Why did you leave? Now that's what Jude says. Who left their first estate. How wrong we have been. I have listened to all the teaching about demons for many a year. Why have you left, and listen to this, and lain with women and become unclean with the daughters of men, and you were spiritual, holy, living an eternal life, but you became unclean upon the women and begot children through the blood of flesh and lusted after the blood of men and produced flesh and blood as they do, who die, who die and are described. Now that is recorded in Genesis chapter 6. And it starts off with, and this is what it says in the King James Version, uh, the sons of God, the sons of God saw that I think it is the sons of men that they were beautiful and so off, and, and they lusted after them and so on. Now the general idea from the theologians today that came into existence this idea in 400 AD only, 
was not in existence before is that of the children of Seth. En uh, Enoch clearly states in his book, Their Spirits. Now, I want to go on further about this because God says, but you formerly were spiritual, living an eternal, immortal life for all the generations of the world. For this reason, God said, I did not arrange wives for you, because the dwelling of the spiritual ones is in heaven. And Jesus said that when we get to heaven, we won't have intercourse or have children. I mean, that's, we all know that. We'd be like the angels who are in heaven now not like those angels who fell. Then he talks about the giants. Now it says in chapter 6, there were giants in the earth in those days. Now the giants who were born from body and flesh will be called evil spirits on the earth. And on the earth will be their dwelling. Now listen. And evil spirits came out from their flesh, these giants, because from above they were created from the holy watchers who saw the women and lusted was their origin and first foundation. Evil spirits, they will be on earth and spirits of the evil ones, plural, they will be called. No mention of Satan, it's quite astounding. No mention of any supposed war in heaven. And I've always taken, or for many a year have taken this stance, do you mean to tell me that God would fight with Satan? God doesn't fight with anybody. He, he's already over them. He, he made them. He doesn't fight. He's not having a fight. Now Jesus had a fight because he fought on the cross for us. That's different. And I th we think we... And, and the death of the giants wherever the spirits have gone out from their bodies. You see? These spirits are around today. Now, everybody knows that. So, everybody who's a Christian knows they're evil spirits, and many a non-Christian does too. If anybody's got any sense, they will see something's going on when they get into witchcraft and see it all on television and all the weird things that I don't watch that can be seen on television if you have, uh, if you have Ostar, not if you have just the local channels. We're now going to listen to this. The spirits of the angels who were promiscuous with women will stand here and they assuming many forms made men unclean and will lead men astray so that they sacrifice to demons as gods. Goes on throughout India today. Japan, amongst the Islamic world, is a certain. So what are they doing when they're sacrificing? They go to Mecca and follow that. They're doing it to demons. So now we look at something else, because we have to see that these are working against the Church of Jesus Christ. It says so, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Look, we're in a wrestling match. Now listen to this. Because most Christians wouldn't want to hear this about the demons. They only like to hear it when it's kind of something that gets into a person and let's cast him out. They don't want to hear all this warfare that's going on about their doctrines because it's mainly about doctrine. The doctrine of the church. In fact, apart from persecution, it is doctrine. Now, I knew this without knowing all this and have preached it because when the charismatics come up with, came up with Ephesians 6, we're in a warfare all the time, I preached against what they were saying and I just said straight out, this is many years ago, the book of Ephesians is talking about two things, persecution and doctrine, if you read it. That I knew that church was under persecution 
they were, as they all were. And the other thing was the doctrine. What does Paul say? Don't follow every wind of doctrine. Isn't that correct? Isn't he talking about in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, the glories of the, of the riches of Christ? He's talking about the gospel there. It, we, we have to be aware of it to know what's going on so that we stand against it. One, in doctrine. Get the right doctrine. Get the right doctrine. The church does not have the right doctrines, plural. None of us have had the right doctrines, plural. We've all been tainted by what we were taught. And it's taken me a lifetime of the, and certainly the last 20, 30, 40 years to gradually, so slowly, realize the errors that we have been taught. So now that I know, what am I to do? Share it with others. Stand and fight the good fight with all my might. And that's what we have to do. So that means we expose. We've got to expose the errors. Don't be ashamed of talking about it. Now, a lot of people don't like you saying anything about anybody. Yeah. The Apostle Paul did. He said the Cretans are liars. <laughs> In, uh, I forget what book he said that. He said the Cretans are liars. He, he spoke against the Jews. He said they hate all, they're haters of men. They hate men. They're persecutors. What did Jesus do? He spoke against the Jews all the way through the gospel. He said everything bad he said that I can think of, apart from talking about hell uh, and slight things like that, everything bad he said was directed to the Jews. Are we going to stop saying a word against the wrongdoers when our Lord and Saviour pointed it out all the time? You, you know that's true. He pointed it out all the time, didn't he? And how blind we have been. We've read those parables and everything you said over and over. Knew he was doing it and didn't realise what he really was doing. So, I'm reading this bit. Then I asked Raphael, he's got the name of angels, the angel who was with me, and said to him, Whose is this spirit, whose voice thus reaches heaven and complains? He was complaining all the time. This spirit of a man who was dead. Of course, let's realize Enoch lived and walked with God. God didn't walk with Enoch. Enoch walked with God. Where's God in heaven? And there is an occasion, and I'll read it to you later, when the father of Noah, when uh, uh, it might have been, when Methuselah, the grandfather of Noah, said to the father of Noah, and I'll tell you the story later, go to Enoch. Find him because he lives with the angels. He was having such visions all the time, he was living with the angels, the only man in the whole of the Old Testament and certainly in the whole of the New Testament. Do not be surprised at that. Don't be surprised at that. Look at all the visions Ezekiel had. Have you read them? Isaiah, have you read them? What about Daniel? Do you know them? Do you know the meaning? takes a long while to get to know the meanings. What about the other prophets? What about the experience of Moses? And I tell you one reason the church has rejected this book of Enoch, it's too experiential. They say you can't build on experiences. Look, the Baptists say it, the non-Pentecostals say it, I see what they've read and they've sent emails to me and said the same thing. We're not building on experiences, we're building on the Word of God. But the Word of God is dealing with experiences. Have you had an experience with Christ or not? If you haven't had an experience with Christ, you're not born again. Isn't that true? 
And if you haven't had the experience of water baptism, well, you might get to heaven, but you missed out on something, a little something. If you haven't had the experience of walking with God, you just haven't walked with God, in a, even in a small way. So this is the experience. And Raphael answered, This spirit is the one that came out of Abel, whom Cain, his brother, killed. Now, don't be amazed at that. What does it say in the book of Hebrews towards the end? The Father of Spirits. God, our Father, is not the Father of this fleshly person. He's the Father of my spirit. He's the Father of your spirit. Isn't that wonderful? He's the Father of your spirit and your spirit. And also, I think it's Ecclesiastes, it says, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. Every soul born here has a certain Spirit that is given to every person. And now that doesn't mean to say that the Spirit's going to live with God. It just returns from the source, which is that invisible realm. And so here's Abel, his spirit. And it says, This spirit is the one that came out of Abel, whom Cain, his brother, killed. And he, 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 he's a being. He's still a human being, but not human yet, because he's still a spirit. When, we, when, when Christians die and go to heaven, they go to heaven, but they're not human yet, are they? Until the resurrection day until Jesus comes and we get an immortal body because we're still made and created by God body, soul and spirit. The body was created first and all these followers of Hagen and Copeland they're really in er error when they say we are spirit beings. We are not. We're human beings. What did God create first? The body. He formed it out of the dust of the earth. He formed it. The organs were already there. The heart was already there before he put the spirit and the soul in. It's important. Now, this is what the angel said. And he will complain about him until his offspring, complain about Cain, until his offspring are destroyed from the face of the earth and from amongst the offspring of men, his offspring perish. Who are the offspring of Cain? Every single human being? No. The offspring of Cain are those who have the same spirit, evil spirit, that Cain had. And I'll say straight out, they're the Jews. They're the Jews who go back through the Khazars who were called the snake people. Through the snake people, to this day, the Jews are the Khazars, they're not, they're not the ch children of Abraham, because the descendants of Abraham did not get the spirit of Cain. It was those who went to Babylon, and, uh, who were the children, descendants of Abraham in that sense, but who imbibed all the evil of Babylon to such an extent because it had come from Cain through Nimrod af uh, after the flood. And I would venture to say, but I'm not positive about this, through Japheth or Ham, but I'm not certain about that, but through one of those three sons. Why I say Ham is because he was the one who committed that atrocious act with Noah and the one whom Noah cursed. <clears throat> so now that's something to think, think about. So we have in our society today and in that society then a center. There is a center in secular society 
Now, secular society is full of people who are not born again and some are born again. I'm not talking about religions. So I'm talking about society of every country. It's still full of evil people, still full of sinners. But in this secular society is a center of all the evil that is put out into the world and instigates the evil that the sinners do because, as it says in Ephesians chapter 2, before you found Christ, uh, were accepted by Christ, you were ruled by the spirits of the atmosphere, remember? Ephesians 2, who rule the children of disobedience. Everybody's in that condition. But not everybody is a descendant of Cain. Not everybody is an offspring of Cain. Well, naturally, just think about it. We're not all descendants of Cain. Adam had other children. The whole world didn't just descend from Cain. The whole world descended from all the children of Adam and Eve. I don't know about if there were any children of Abel that he left behind, but every other child had descendants. So it's not a natural descendant. It's something else. It's, we call it religious if you like, it's religious. It's to do with religion. It's not to do with race. It's not to do with, with those who naturally descended from Cain. It's to do with the spirit, the spirits that followed through to, the, to Nimrod after the flood, that followed through and went through all the countries of the world who were full of heathendom, to Babylon that was full of heathendom. And there, Israel and Dan, who were sent by God as a punishment for their idolatry to Babylon for 70 years, were sent by him to the very place where most of them would be impregnated by the spirits of Cain. Amazing story. We don't have to puzzle about it. Let's see it in the scriptures. We don't have to say, why does God do this? Look, it's an amazing story. A better story than any you would ever read written by man. And I found something else in one of these books where it said, the art of writing would be the production of books that would lead people astray. Now, most of our books on the market are secular or evil. Why, when Russell reached high school, uh, they gave him a book to study that a lot of people objected to that was absolutely promiscuous and evil. In those days, teenagers weren't promiscuous like they are today. So it's true. Now, we need to be aware of all this because in this religion is the snake or the serpent or the dragon or the devil or devils or Satan or Satans, they're plural. It would seem there's a singular one overall. I'm not sure about that. Lucifer of Isaiah 14 is not Satan. In fact, the original word is the, uh, the morning star, not Lucifer. That was inserted later. So where has it all come? Out of Babylon. Who has it come out to the world through? The Jews. Do the Jews ex continue to this day in being the center? Yes in this sense. Because the ones who got it in Babylon were not real Hebrews. Many of them would have been descendants. 
they did not follow the Hebrew God. They did not follow the law of Moses. Jesus said they had their own tradition. He said, you don't follow Moses. So they were not that class of saints and holy people who have come through the whole of the Old Testament. We don't know who they are or were. There's such a, a small number in comparison. Generally, all through the Old Testament, if you've ever read it, the nation of Israel, generation after generation, nearly every generation, was full of idolatry. They sacrificed their children to the god of Moloch, to Moloch, who, as I saw on television, was a huge black statue that had, uh, had an opening on its chest. And inside was a burning fire. And these children of Israel would, would offer their children to this God and throw them in the fire. It's, it's mentioned in the Bible. Only the Bible doesn't explain what it is. You have to go to other sources to find out what it is. The Bible's not there to tell you all about heathendom. They're there to tell you about the people whom God is dealing with. And I might say, it's been a known thing for centuries that the Jews to this day kill children of the Goyim and sacrifice them on the day of their Passover and drink the blood. Now, I even read some time ago, and this is historical, how that there was a certain Jew in a certain country in a certain a century, a few centuries ago, he was taken to court for that very thing. Now, we who live in Australia have had no idea, you know. We, uh, it's totally almost unknown that these things have gone on, but a lot of Europeans would know if their parents told them, or if they read the books, or if they read the internet. So, we have these people working in the world today. It's historically so. They started World War II. I remember the start of World War II. I was still young. I remember Neville Chamberlain. I remember the story, but not in detail, about the Danzig Corridor. I did forget that Danzig used to be, the, used to be German and that they took it off Germany after World War I. And I didn't know that, that Hitler was basically the innocent person in the start of that war. He didn't want the war. He was forced into it because they, they went against the Germans in Poland and massacred them, and they did all, the Jews did all kinds of evil things, which is history that most people don't care to look up to find out. So let's be aware of it. What's happening in Ukraine is almost, in a measure, a replica of what went on before World War II. And of course, the, the uh, circumstances are different, the personalities are different, the leaders are different, the countries are different. We're heading for World War III, it would appear, at the instigation of USA and the Jews. Nuclear. Russia will get, has to come into it. She can't sit back and watch what all these people are doing and lying about. Even our Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, and our Foreign Minister. Now, they have to know the truth. I wouldn't believe otherwise. They're not that silly, are they? So, okay, that does affect our natural lives. If it happens, we everywhere are in trouble. And thank God we're <laughs> at the bottom of the antipodes, isn't that what they say? We're at, the, we're at the very south of the hemisphere. Well, maybe we'll escape a bit. Okay, we could be in for it. But that's not the problem. That's not our problem. That's not our concern. We can't alter it. We need to know it. Our concern is the Church of Jesus Christ. 
we're in the battle. Uh, okay, it's the congregation of Jesus Christ. I must quit saying church. Look, I followed all the erroneous ideas and I have these habits. I have a habit of saying Jehovah. I, I, have, I have to confess, I was wrong in my YouTubes last year when I kept on talking about Jehovah. I hadn't found out the truth about the Masoretes, the Jews. I hadn't found out the truth about the name Jehovah. I hadn't found out the truth about the name, uh, what do they call it? Yeah, Mes uh, yeah. yeah that they, they substitute for Christ and for Jesus. The, the Messianic Jews. I hadn't found out the truth about it. No, I have. And I'm not ashamed to say I was wrong. I'm not ashamed to say I, I don't want to make the, to repeat those errors because it's evil. It's evil. It's from demons. I don't want to repeat what the demons are saying. And hopefully I've, they're all eradicated what I've been saying that's wrong. Hopefully. So I, ha I, I don't want to say church anymore. I want to say the assembly, the congregation of the saints. Even whereas Paul says he sends a letter to Ephesians and to the church in such and such. In the book of Revelation, it's not church at all. I looked it up. It's congregation or assembly. Now that's a different meaning. Totally different. So... It concerns us. Now, I'd like to bring in about Noah because it is so wonderful. Now, we have read 1 Peter chapter 2, 18 and 2 Peter 2, verse 5 about Noah, the preacher of righteousness. And what you read about Noah fits in with what is in the Bible about Noah. He's a preacher of righteousness. And we have said for many a day, Christ was in Noah, preaching to those souls that God was waiting for to repent. He didn't go down into the hell and preach to anybody there. That's totally ridiculous. Why would he preach to anybody there? He could never take them up out of hell. He, doesn't have, to t he have to, doesn't have to preach to them and tell them you're, you're going to hell forever. They're already in a place of torment. You know, no reason to preach. There is there, no. when you think about it. So, having said that, this is amazing what happened at the birth of Noah. And I have to accept this with all of my heart. Because, as we said on another occasion, for Noah to be a preacher of righteousness, he was not only talking about righteousness, there was some righteousness that possessed him. And when Christ was in him preaching, Christ possessed him in a, in a way that he never did in any other person in the whole of the Old Testament. Nowhere does it say about anybody else he's a preacher of righteousness. Now we know they were godly men. We know they were in spite of the Holy Ghost. We know that. We know the Holy Ghost filled them enough to write the truth of the Word of God as is in the Septuagint, which is the best truth we know. And, and believe it or not, the, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls prove it. Well, this is what happened about the birth of Noah. And when Methuselah heard the sons of his son Lamech, he went to Enoch. And this is what Lamech had said. I have begotten a strange son. He is not like a man, but is like the children of the angels of heaven. You know, the watchers that fell, that who left their estate. They didn't fall. Of a different type and not like us. And his eyes are like the rays of the sun and his face glorious. And it seems to me that he is not sprung from me but from the angels, these who left their estate. He thought he had a son who were like the other children. 
in that they had a fa were fathered by these angels who left their first estate. Because he said, they looked like angels who belonged to heaven. In other words, there was something about him. And he says, I'm afraid that something extraordinary may be done on the earth in his days. And so he's, he goes to Methuselah and Methuselah tells him to go to Enoch. Now there is a story here, and I hope I can find it, in relation to the wife. So this is the story which I'll recount. And the story is this, as written in the book of Enoch. When Lamech, Lamech, the father of Noah, saw the baby, as it came out in the hands of the midwife, he took this stance, he said, this is, this is not my child. This is a child belonging to those watchers who left the state, like they have begotten children all over the world. And so he went to his wife, he said to his wife, she's just had a baby. He says to his wife, tell me, you must have lain with somebody else but other than me. This is not my child. And he goes on like this, reproaches her. And she keeps on arguing against it. He says, no, I did not. And she's crying and weeping because her husband's accusing her of, of adultery that she didn't perform. So then Lamech goes to Enoch and we have to have to see this in his reply because it's an amazing thing that he says. And he says these words. I said before that they're called Satans, for they have learned all the secret of the angels and all the wrongdoings of the Satans, plural, or devils, or demons. We'll leave that for a while, and I want to make mention of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, I knew about the Dead Sea Scrolls years ago and read what theologians said and, yeah, I wasn't all that interested. But my son, Russell, got interested in the Dead Sea Scrolls on the internet and he downloaded quite a lot of what they have found in manuscripts that were tattered and torn and the scholars spent years piecing them all together, restoring them, doing everything they could. And they were in a certain language, and somebody would have had to have known the language. And they have translated some of it into English. But you don't get the whole story because they can't see, they can't find a way to restore certain words. Now, here, here is the story of Lamech. And this is where I have it about these, these women. So uh, I'll go back to here, and here it is. Then Lamech says to his wife, he was upset when she says all this, and he says to his wife, this is the Dead Sea Scrolls. I bear witness by the Most High, by the Mighty Lord, by the King of all ages. Don't you read about that in the New Testament, those descriptions of God? The, of the sons of heaven, that you must truthfully recount everything for me. Whether you must recount for me without lies, he's talking to his wife. The son born from you is unique by the king of all ages, that you will speak truth for me without lies. Then Batanosh, my wife, the Dead Sea Scrolls, spoke with me very harshly, and she wept. And she said, O oh, my brother and my husband, you, should, you yourself should remember my pleasure in the heat of the moment and my panting breath. Now I tell you everything truthfully, 
And then his demeanor changed. And this is what transpires. And she says, I swear to you, by the great Holy One, by the King of Heaven. Remember, these are not Christians. We don't swear. That this seed is from you. And from you, this conception. And from you, the planting of this fruit. And not from any stranger. And not from any of the watchers. Nor from any of the sons of heaven. The sons of God. Then I, Lamech, ran to Methuselah, my father, to learn everything from him, since he is the beloved and gap with the holy ones. His lot is apportioned. Now that's interesting. Election. His lot is apportioned. Makes you think our lots are apportioned. Praise God. And they make everything known to him. Now when Methuselah, my father, heard he ran to Enoch, his father, to learn everything truthfully from him. And he went through the length of the land of Parvain, and there he found the end of the earth. <laughs> he said to Enoch, his father, O oh, my father, my lord, I have come to you. You know, there's gaps now. Do not be angry. And then he continues on like this. And a lot of it is missing. But it says, they will be over, the progeny of Noah will be over all the land. And uh, Noah is the one who will divide the entire earth. Remember, he came out of the ark with three sons and their wives. And Noah, Enoch gave to Methuselah his son understand him. And a lot of this is missing. Anyway, this is very amazing. And there's more here. He wrote all of them in the scroll as remembrance. Now to you, Methuselah, of this child, when I, en Enoch, something, from the sons of heaven, but from Lamech your son, and in resemblance he is not, etc., etc. And now I'm talking to you, go say to Lamech, the child is rightfully from you and not from the sons of heaven. And his exaltation on the earth and every act of judgment I will entrust to him. Now Lamech, uh, Methuselah lifted his face to me, says Enoch, and his eyes shone. And then Enoch says something like, this child is a light. And so forth. And I'll just to finish that bit. When Methuselah heard the words, and he spoke with Lamech, he went back to him. And when I, Lamech, heard, rejoicing that from me, etc. And this is in the book of the words of Noah. Isn't it amazing? What a terrible attack by the devil on the church to keep this book from us. Because it has kept the church in ignorance of what the devil is really doing so that the devil makes inroads through the Jews. He has made the inroads through the Jews from the word go. From the Masoretic Jews who some of them may have been descendants from Abraham but were Edomites and so forth, to the Jews of this day. Now why are they all, who are not the children of Abraham, part of it? Because they took on the religion and the demons. They took on the spirit of Cain. And they have imbibed it and are possessed by Satan. As clearly as that. They are the children of Satan. Let's be aware of our enemies. Now we're going to close very shortly because I need to say this. As believers, we are not the seed of Satan. 
We are not under the control of sin. We are the seed of Christ. Now, as believers, something is going to happen to us in a way similar to Noah, to Enoch, sorry. Enoch walked with God and was translated, the Septuagint says. Now, all my life that I can remember, I heard from the pulpit correctly that that was a type of the translation of the saints in the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to take us to heaven. But look how Enoch lived with God, with the angels, having supernatural experiences, knowing the truths of the word that God spoke. We are to have the same thing. The truths of the word that God has spoken. And not only that, the supernatural experiences of the Holy Ghost and from the Word of God, which is the New Testament, which is in particular the epistles. Now the Bible says to keep ourselves unspotted from the world. And how has the devil attacked in another way through the Jews, all Christians, because it... it it, it, it filters down to every Christian in the West in particular. They have attacked them because 70 million Christians in USA are Zionist Christians. 70 million. The pulpits are full more so than in Australia, and it's bad enough in Australia. Their pulpits are full of pastors exalting Israel all the time, exalting the Jews. They lobby, they lobby Washington. They send money to Israel. USA has sent billions, if not trillions of money to, to Israel over the past 20, 30 years. Germany has been paying tribute by the millions to these Jewish bankers. And the wealth of USA is owned 45% of it by the Jews. And they're only 3% of the population. It's in the church. So what has come into the church? It might have been there from... 200 AD is certainly here today. The three things that the Jews follow that were the three temptations that Satan brought to Jesus. Love of money, love of power, love of popularity. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life fills our churches. They want to do well in life. You see the same thing when you go to India. I've seen the same thing in the Pentecostal churches, even in my own experience in life. So, the last generation didn't do as well as we did. So, okay, we want them to go better than we did. They're doing this all throughout India. The very low caste pastors are begging and begging everybody for money to educate their children in university so their children are in higher positions and don't follow the ministry mainly and marry up. It's the same in our churches. The same amongst our Christians. The love of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. The love of money is the root of all evil, not money. The love of money. Of course, everybody loves to say, oh, yes, it's not money. And all the time they're loving money. Now, we have to have a certain regard for money or we can't live. Okay, how about popularity? Look, every pastor wants to be popular. Church people want to be popular. Mm -mm. Jesus never wanted to be popular. Paul never wanted to be popular. And what about power? There's hierarchy in every denomination. 
What did Jesus say? When the disciples were quarreling, before, just before he went to the cross, they're quarreling. Who's going to sit by his side when he's on the throne? And he's going to the cross. And even though he hadn't heard them, he knew. The divine Son of God, he said, what were you talking about? Then he said, it is not with you as it is with the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles have power, position, wealth, hierarchy, fame. He says, it's not the same with you. And the church hasn't followed that. But the funny part about it is some people have, and some, believe it or not, Catholic uh, nuns and monks have done it, but they've done it for the church and said they were the bride of Christ. But they've had that attitude. And yes, Christians have done it. I remember the founder of uh, WEC, Worldwide Evangelistic Crusade, uh, Stud and his wife, upper class English. Cambridge Blues, who were in the rowing team. Hillary might know more about this than I do. Full of money. Full of position. God called them to be missionaries. So I think they went first to Southeast Asia. And when they were there somewhere, this is what they did. They gave away all their money to the Salvation Army. Now, to me, that was an amazing and wonderful thing to do. So what did they live on after that? Faith. And he founded a worldwide organization of missionaries that exists to this day. I met them in Indonesia, and uh, Keith Morton's and the Morton's cousin, Betty, was a WEC missionary who went to Africa. She even went to Paris to learn French. And uh, she lives in Toowoomba today, a WEC missionary. She's now a Pentecostal. Very strong, evangelical, godly organization. And you know something else he did that I don't even really believe in and wouldn't do it myself. Because his wife was kind of worn out or diseased, because of her missionary service. She couldn't stand it anymore. He sent her back to England. He stayed in Africa 15 years without their meeting. I think they might have met once. She died, he died. Now to me, that is a sacrifice beyond compare what they did. But how many souls are in heaven today? Because they did it. And there have been others like them. I have read the stories of British missionaries since childhood. You know, you get these books as a Sunday school prize. I read them all. I tell you what, I thought it was marvelous. I read all about the China Inland Mission. I read all about the missionaries, most missionaries. And I tell you, I've been to India. I've been to Malaysia. I've seen their cemeteries. I've seen how they died. A whole family taken by cholera or suffering, dying young and living in India. I know what it's like to live in India in these modern days is bad enough. But to live there then, the sacrifices they made out of love for Christ. William Carey, the, the first missionary, Baptist, the sacrifices he made. The brethren. I've been amongst the brethren who were founded by the missionaries. I've been amongst them, preached there. And I've preached to brethren from Andhra Pradesh who were there as a result of William Carey's sacrifice. Yeah. So people do sacrifice. And, and I honour them because they do things I would never do myself and have never done. But you know, honour to whom honour is due, the Bible says. We owe them honour, even if we don't do what they say. So, because of 
what's happening in relation to the Church of Jesus Christ, let's realize we're under attack. We're under attack. We've been under attack. Let's get it right and fight the good fight with all our might. Amen? Amen. Don't you think it's wonderful? And astounding? And amazing? Absolutely amazing. I've got just a couple of little things here. Um, and incidentally, uh, uh, we downloaded Thompson's Septuagint ages ago, and that was done in USA, years in the 19th century. And he actually says this. He quotes what is already said by somebody somebody who put the frontispiece to this book. And he's, he talks about Cook, Mr. Stanley Cook, etc., gave an account of a Hebrew papyrus from Egypt, now in the possession of Mr. Nash, FSA. It is the only known biblical papyrus in Hebrew and contains the Ten Commandments and the commencement of the Shema. But listen to this. Now you know what I've been saying is right. It differs more widely from the Masoretic text than any extant Hebrew manuscript. So the original manuscripts were totally lost except for that. And what we have today is the corrupted manuscripts of the Old Testament from the Masoretic Jews from whence comes our King James Version. Quite staggering, isn't it? The attack of Satan. Praise God, we're seeing some light. That's all I can say. Us, just a few of us. Amazing. Our portioned lot. That's all you can say. Glory be to God, that's all you can say. Bow.